embarrassed to say this, but sometimes I know a query could use an index, but I'm not sure what kind of index to add. What's up, everyone? I don't know who that guy was, but I could definitely relate to him, right? Especially when I was starting out with SQL Server. I knew I could add an index to improve performance to one of my queries, but I wasn't always sure what kind of index to add. So today, I want to talk about the two most common types of indexes, clustered and non-clustered row store indexes, and kind of go over examples of what are the differences between them and when they should be used. So to start out, right, every table of data in SQL Server has some kind of natural order in it. Um, that natural order could just be random, in which case our table is what's called a heap, right? If there is no defined order on that table, the data just kind of gets inserted and stored in whatever random order it, you know, manages to get in there. And while there are some special instances where storing data in that kind of fashion can help performance, usually it's not very helpful, right? Because SQL Server is constantly looking up very specific data and it can't find that in an unsorted heap. So if we don't want to store data just in any haphazard random order in a heap, the way we define an order for how our data is stored is by using a clustered index. The clustered index itself is defining what order the data in our table is stored in. Each table can only have one clustered index because you can't store the data in a, in a database table in more than one order, right? It can't exist in two different states at the same time unless you create a copy of all that data. But when we add a clustered index, it defines the order that our data is stored in, making it one, really easy and fast for SQL Server to find the data it needs because data is sorted and computers are really great at finding pieces of information out of sorted data. And secondly, that data, since it's already sorted, if our queries are returning that data in that same sorted order that is defined in our clustered index, makes things a lot easier for SQL 2, since it doesn't have to do any additional ordering operations. Now, a lot of people put clustered indexes on their primary keys, right? So a primary key is what defines a unique record in your table. And by default, if you use the SSMS uh, GUI, it'll add a clustered index onto your primary key but it doesn't need to, right? So having that clustered index primary key is fine in a lot of situations, especially where you're going to be constantly, you know, retrieving data based on the primary key, like maybe in an OLTP system. But having that primary key be a clustered index isn't always the most optimal solution. For example, let's say we have a table that actually has a date time column in it, and we're doing reporting on that table, and our reports are always returning data on you know, the most recent records inserted in that table based on that date time column. In that case, it might not be better to have that clustered index on our primary key, but instead have the clustered index on our date time column. The reason being is if we're constantly returning the last you know, three hours worth of data, if SQL is storing that data in that date time sort order, then it makes it really easy for SQL to get that data way better than having to use some other type of index or wasting our clustered index on our primary key, which we're not even querying our data on. Now, a downside of having our clustered index on a table is that if we are gonna be doing inserts or updates, things might get a little messy because our clustered index stores data in a certain order, stores the actual table data in a certain order. If we're inserting a record that's you know not the most recent value, and not the oldest value, SQL is going to have to insert it somewhere in the middle. And if there's not enough free space available kind of in the middle of that table, it's going to have to start shifting data around so that that new inserted row fits. All of that extra processing could take some time and that index could actually slow down things like your inserts. Since our clustered index defines the sort order of the data in our table, there are some benefits, right? If we want to return all the columns in the table, our index can filter down to a certain row based on a where clause or a join or something like that. And then the rest of that row's data, right, which isn't part of the index, is right in the same location as the index data, right? SQL's not gonna have to go and do additional lookups to retrieve that data like it might have to with other types of indexes. That means if you're selecting a lot of columns from your table or all the columns in your table, that clustered index might give you really good performance. So an analogy for clustered indexes could be something like a book. Here I have the Edible Wild Mushrooms of North America guidebook and um, 
if we look at something like the table of contents, it's going to list items in the book chapter by chapter, organized by the way you would read the book. Um, so if I'm reading through this book and I, you know, I'm learning first about different species of mushrooms and then how to identify them and how to recognize toxic ones, clustered index is great for that. I can easily go to the chapter I'm interested in and all the data I want is there. I don't need to do additional lookups to go find different data elsewhere in the book. However, this clustered index, while generally great for reading through the book, you know, from start to finish, isn't great for looking up specific types of information. So what I might do is then add a non-clustered index. A non-clustered index is a separate file that lists things in a sorted order based on whatever columns you're indexing, and then gives you a pointer to where the actual data is stored in SQL Server. You can think of this as the index in the back of my book, right? So the index has all the different topics and species of mushrooms listed in alphabetical order. So while if I wanna find chanterelle mushrooms by reading through the book start to finish, it's gonna be hard to find them. I don't even know where it is because the book isn't organized in order of mushrooms. However, if I go to my index, I could find chanterelle mushrooms and I know they're on page 126. So then I can go flip to page 126 and find my chanterelle mushrooms. That's basically how a non-clustered index works. We have our index, like in the back of the book, which has data on our index columns in sorted order. And then to find out the additional information that goes along with that row of data, we actually have to go to the data page in the database that contains that information. So the index just contains the sorted index column data, and then a pointer to where to actually go find the remainder of that data on disk. So non-clustered indexes are great because they also improve performance, and unlike a clustered index where we can only have one of them on our table, we can have essentially unlimited non-clustered indexes. I think the limit 999, but you should never even approach having that many non-clustered indexes on your table. And the reason for that is these non-clustered indexes have some overhead. Since SQL is building an index of the alphabetical you know, values, the sorted values that are listed in our non-clustered index uh, columns, that's extra data, that's duplicate data that SQL's creating. So if we have our mushroom, uh, list of mushroom names as our index column, SQL's actually gonna copy all the unique mushroom name values into a separate file where it can store them sorted, and then those mushroom names point to where the rest of the row information is in the database. That means every non-clustered index you add, adds some kind of overhead, right, in terms of space and duplicating data. So at some point, these indexes may help and improve performance, but they might become too cumbersome and actually hinder performance, right, because of all the additional space they're taking up and just all the additional lookups that might be having to happen. Since our non-clustered index is just, you know, a narrow amount of data, it's usually, you know, one to a few columns, and then just pointers to where the actual data exists on disk, it makes it much easier to use in columns that you know, might be updated. So unlike our clustered index, where if we try to insert a piece of data in the middle that falls in the middle of our index, and then SQL may have to rearrange data in order to get it to fit in the right spot, a non-clustered index is much more efficient for those kinds of inserts because SQL just has to do that in the ordered index you know, column name, but then the pointers can point to the data and the data can exist anywhere on disk. SQL isn't actually having to move all that row data around every time the index gets updated. So for tables that are getting constantly updated, a non-clustered index might be a better way to go. If you do want to get more of the type of performance that you would get from a clustered index with a non-clustered index, you can actually include additional columns of data in your index. So instead of SQL just copying the unique index column values to their own index file, you can include additional columns so then SQL doesn't have to go do an expensive lookup to actually retrieve the row data from somewhere else in the database. You can actually create a copy of that data and include it on your index. While that may make your queries run faster because SQL doesn't have to do you know, lookups to find the actual row data somewhere else in the database, we're once again experiencing that overhead because that copy of those included columns inside the index, you know, take up more space. So before we wrap up, I just also want to kind of make clear that everything I said today can probably have an asterisk, right, or a caveat along with it. These are just general rules. There's edge cases and corner cases for everything when it comes to things like indexes. But these guidelines that I talked about today are kind of the basics 
to help you get past that paralysis of not knowing, okay, which index do I start with uh, when trying to improve performance in a query. And with that said, even though I think these guidelines are good and they're the ones that I always use, um, they're never perfect, right? So before you go and add indexes in production, try them out on some test data, see how they're gonna affect the new queries that you're trying to improve performance on, as well as the old queries that already exist. I've seen plenty of times where I add a new index that helps one query, but you know performance regression happens on a bunch of other queries that were running just fine on the database. So by adding a new index, I actually hurt performance on those old queries. The only way to for certain know to avoid that is just to test. You can't you know, know for certain with this stuff. You just have to try something, test it. If it helps all around, great, you can keep it. If it doesn't, then get rid of it, try something else. In the blog post that I've done along with this video post, I've included some additional examples of common usage scenarios of when you might want to use a certain type of index for a certain type of table data or structure that might exist in your database. I've linked to that blog post below, so if you want to go through those examples for yourself and kind of test your knowledge on when you should use a certain type of index, go ahead and uh, try those out. So thanks for watching today. I hope this was a good overview of clustered and non-clustered indexes so that you can kind of make a better informed decision when trying to add new indexes to a table to improve SQL query performance. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.